adjunct professor of Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, David Phillips. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Dear David, as you know, um, uh, the Kurdish conflict, the Kurdish question is one of the oldest uh, questions in the world now, and it still continues with the conflict, especially based in the uh, Middle East. So, first of all, how important to uh, resolve that Kurdish question, and what will be the benefits to the Middle East of the end of that uh, Kurdish uh, question, as well as the conflict between Turkey and, and the Kurds? So the past hundred years have been a century of betrayal and abuse uh, for Kurds in North, East, West, and South Kurdistan. I, it started with the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, which made no mention of Kurd or Kurdistan and withdrew the international community's support uh, for the Treaty of Sevres. It continued in 1975 with the Treaty of Algiers, which sold out Kurdish interests in favor of an agreement between Iraq and Iran on the Shat al-Arab. Then after the Gulf War, President George H.W. Bush encouraged the Kurds to rise up, take matters into their own hands. Uh, when the Iraqi armed forces counterattacked using um, helicopter gunships, the U.S. abandoned the Kurds, and many were killed, and more than a million were displaced. And the latest betrayal occurred um, in a conversation between Donald Trump and uh, Tayyip Erdogan, where Trump told Erdogan that the Kurdish problem was his, that the U.S. didn't want to be involved, and then withdrew its support for the Kurds in North and East Syria. Uh, we know what happened with the occupation of territories and the killing of Kurdish civilians that followed that. And in each instance of betrayal, there was a series of steps uh, abusing the interests of Kurds, including their killing, their imprisonment, their torture, the denial of their national rights and right to self-determination. So as, as we talked about just before our interview that the uh, Kurdish freedom movement leader, Mr. Abdullah Öcalan's freedom and um, the so, uh, political solution for the Kurdish question uh, is uh, something deeply related. And also uh, the Kurds and their friends now um, started a new campaign exactly in the same name, Freedom for Regional Political Solution for the Kurdish Question. So how would you going to evaluate that? How important is freeing Öcalan and how important is to uh, solve the Kurdish question in the Middle East? So of course, freeing Öcalan is important, both materially and symbolically. But I think that uh, the discussion about Öcalan's imprisonment uh, has pushed back as a priority the discussion about freedom for Kurds in the Middle East. Instead of talking about the conditions of Öcalan's imprisonment, uh, we should be talking about how to protect and promote the rights of Kurds, how to guarantee their right to self-determination, and achieve uh, a federal democratic status in countries where they reside. Uh, I think that the discussion about Ocalan has proven to be a distraction from the core issues that we should be focusing on. Thank you. Um, also, as you know, the Kurds has been fighting against ISIS and they uh, defeated the ISIS. And, but today, when we look at to the uh, European um, uh, agenda, uh, Kurds has been criminalized. For example, the PKK is still on the terrorist organizations list. So how important to delist the PKK as well as in Europe still uh, the, the governments, the states are uh, still uh, criminalizing the Kurdish community. So 
how would you going to evaluate that? Uh, first, I think we should acknowledge the huge sacrifice that Kurds made at the behest of the United States in fighting ISIS. I think the number is 14,000 Kurds were killed and 25,000 seriously injured. There should have been an agreement in place before the Kurds joined the global war against ISIS uh, that would have guaranteed them some status afterwards. Uh, there was no such agreement existing. Uh, now the Kurds are paying the price. Uh, Western powers have taken advantage of them, have sacrificed them, and there's no reward for the Kurds. So despite uh, a series of unilateral ceasefires by the PKK, it hasn't uh, been able to bring parties to the table for a negotiated political solution to the Kurdish question. Um, I've written a paper for the Brookings Institution describing how the PKK could be removed from the list of foreign terrorist organizations maintained by the US and other Western countries uh, as part of a broader political process, including dialogue. The PKK should not be listed as a terror organization because its attacks were always against regime symbols and military targets, which is very different, for example, than Hamas, which is attacked. So to be removed from the FTO would be an important step for the Kurds uh, to benefit. Uh, they can do that within a broader political process that includes negotiations on their status. Uh, they should not be on the, on the FTO list, uh, but they won't be removed until there is a political dialogue going on that catalyzes a change in Turkey's policy and also policies of the U.S. and Western countries. Thank you, David. Also, um, as you know, in Rojava, there is a self-administration of the Kurds, and that includes all the uh, communities in Rojava, such as like Assyrians, Syrians, um, Arabs as well. So um, this is called a Rojava revolution. Do you think this can be a, a example for um, a new system um, against the, the 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 capitalism. Do you think that works, and do you think uh, the world should take it as an example? So I don't think it's an example against capitalism. Uh, it's an example for local self-government, for environmental protection, and women's rights. All of those principles can coexist. Uh, in a capitalist economy. Uh, I think the Kurdish experience in uh, North and East Syria is very valuable first and foremost for Syria itself. People are always talking about a way forward in Syria. If Damascus would adopt the same principles of self-government as have been adopted in North and East Syria, that would be a very strong basis for coexistence. Unfortunately, the proposal for democratic federalism is something that's viewed uh, as hostile to the interests of countries where Kurds reside. Uh, it is not. It is very compatible with power sharing in Iraq, Iran, uh, and Turkey. We've already discussed Syria. Uh, but there needs to be a negotiation. Uh, unfortunately, those countries have a reflexive objection to decentralizing power to the Kurdish regions because they view it as a step towards fragmentation. Um, if the Kurds feel that they can achieve their rights through decentralization, um, then they can exercise their right to self-determination without having to break up the countries where they're currently living. I think this is the preferred solution that serves Kurdish interests and also sets the stage for negotiation on all matters. So let's back, get back to the Middle East. As you know, in Turkey, um, there is many Kurdish uh, politicians has been 
arrested as well as journalists. Uh, also, Turkey still continues to um, drone attacks to the Rojava as well. So, um, why do you think still Turkey fighting against the Kurds? Uh, do they benefiting from that, or is it political uh, war? So, um, do you think if that war ends, this will be helpful for a uh, solution and a sustainability for the region? The Kurds do not pose any threat to the regimes in Ankara or Damascus. Uh, it is in the interest of those regimes to find a modus vivendi, a way of living with Kurds that strengthens democracy and advances a goal of social and economic development. I think that the reason why Kurds are targeted is because as long as there is an external victim, uh, then those regimes can justify military aggression. You remember what Ataturk stated as his goal, uh, peace abroad and peace at home. Turkey especially uh, resists any kind of peace process because it welcomes conflict with the Kurds as a way of justifying its continued hostility and aggression. Kurds should make it very clear what their goals are, uh, what democratic federalism means, and that they can still achieve their right to self-determination without violently breaking up the states where they reside that would set the stage for more peaceful coexistence. Is there anything else you would like to add on about this topic? Anything I didn't ask about the uh, Middle East and Kurdish question, please have your last words. It's very important that you're uh, evaluating that topic and you're doing really good points as well. So please have your last words. So two points here. Um, Donald Trump called the Kurds really good fighters. They're much more than that. They're partners, um, and they are a force for democratization. If the U.S. supported democratic developments involving Kurdish communities, it would advance the democratization goals in all countries in the region. And the last point I would raise is that uh, Kurds are not terrorists. Uh, they do not attack civilians or civilian targets. What Hamas has done, however, in Israel, uh, beheading babies, taking 1,200, killing 1,200 people and taking hostages, those are the acts of a terrorist organization. So the Kurds should differentiate themselves from Hamas because their movement is a peaceful, democratic movement of nation building. Thank you, David Adjan, uh, professor at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. David Phillips, thanks for joining us and thank you for your valuable comments today. Thank you very much.